for this uh, on this uh, fine morning of Election Day. We are working our way through all four of the major Republican candidates for governor. And with us right now is Attorney General and candidate for Governor Patrick Morrissey. Patrick, good morning to you. Thank you for being with us. Hey, good morning to you. I hope things are going well. I'm uh, gearing up, excited to go to the polls and vote here in Shenandoah and Jefferson County. And uh, looking forward to a busy day and hopefully a great day for the state of West Virginia. Yeah, most of the polls that we've seen have you in the lead uh, or right there, uh, depending on the poll. Uh, how are you feeling, and do you have any internal numbers that uh, give you any confidence for today? You know, I'm optimistic for today, but we're going to keep running through the tape. Uh, that's how we have always done well in these elections, and I'm going to keep talking about my record. I'm the only proven conservative with a record of getting big things done for our state. I think uh, folks listening know me in the Eastern Panel. I've been on your show, Rob. I guess it's coming on over 12 years now. I can remember at the very beginning when I was first running for attorney general. And then, as, as many people in the panhandle know, I've kept coming back. I don't just uh, leave and abandon uh, the home base. I'm a big believer in the folks of the Eastern Panhandle. It's a great group of folks, and uh, they deserve representation down in Charleston and someone who understands their issues. And so I'm hopeful we're going to get a big turnout in the Eastern Panhandle and across West Virginia. And I'm hopeful that conservatives come out because they know we have a record. We've led with integrity. We've been able to get a lot done protecting our jobs, fighting to go after the drug menace, and ultimately preserving our Constitution and our freedoms. And so uh, I don't take anything for granted, but I'm urging everyone to get out to vote. And I'd be uh, just honored if folks would serve me with with a vote so I can help our state and our country. You have a record because you have, as you mentioned, been an elected official for 12 years. And, and yes, you have, for the most part, made monthly appearances on this program since you were elected. Tell us your accomplishments as Attorney General, which you believe would help those who have not yet voted, vote for you today. Absolutely. I, I think a lot of times in campaigns, people focus on the ideas, what people are saying. And I think that's important. But it's also critical to look at what someone has done in their career. And as the West Virginia Attorney General, I've taken on a lot of the big challenges facing our state. So when it came to advancing educational attainment in West Virginia, we successfully defended the HOPE scholarship law to expand school choice in our state, and that was under attack. When it came to pushing back against the federal government, And they were trying to eliminate so many of our energy jobs here in West Virginia. I built the 23-state coalition that went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and we won. We defeated large chunks of the Biden Green New Deal. When it came to stopping the massive federal overreach where the federal government, the EPA, they were trying to label your backyard ditch or your ephemeral stream the same way as the Potomac the Ohio, the Mississippi River, basically quintessential overreach. I put the coalition together. We went up into court and we stopped it. When it came to stopping our uh, attacks on our gun rights, we went in, we got things done. We have 38 states where we have gun reciprocity agreements. When I started, we were about 20 or so. That's good hard work. And that's the kind of work that you do as attorney general. We took on the drug companies and we won over $1 billion in settlement money, and that's number one per person in the country, and it's not even close. All of those things are needed. Those skill sets are needed for our next governor because we have major challenges that we're facing coming from Washington and outside of our state, whether we're talking about mandatory electric vehicles or the efforts to completely rewrite Title IX, which I think would be devastating for uh, young women in West Virginia, or just to try to wipe out our values here in West Virginia and kind of advance Washington, D.C., woke left values. I've been the guy that stepped up against all of that as the attorney general, and I think that as governor will be well positioned to not only continue that, but to take on policies that are going to grow our standard of living, advance educational attainment, and really build out our workforce participation rates the right way. So, 
I'm excited to have the opportunity to, to win today and to serve as your next governor, and I would humbly ask for your vote. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, good morning, Patrick. Uh, there's no question. I don't know. I've not heard a single person uh, that has questioned your accomplishments as attorney general. So our, we applaud you for that. Uh, how would you shift that to a governor? These are two different jobs, two different approaches. Uh, you've uh, you've spent a lot of your time talking about the accomplishments, but less of your time talking about what you do the first couple of days you'd be in office as governor. You know, Bill, Bill let, me, let me talk a little bit about it. I'm glad you asked because I do talk a lot about what would happen on day one. But I think it's important for voters to know that all the other people, the candidates talking about day one, they don't have the wherewithal to be able to do the things they're saying they're going to do on day one because it helps to have the knowledge base, right? If you've worked on educational issues, if you've defended jobs, if you fought for your values, if you know your constitution – and you fought to advance freedoms, you've opposed the federal government, you're well positioned on day one. And here's what day one looks like. Day one will be that we begin by becoming much more competitive with all the states that we touch. And what I envision is you can, you can think about a conference room in front of you, and you lay out all of the taxes that West Virginia pays. It could be income tax, severance tax, sales tax, excise tax, gas taxes, and then you compare them with all the states that you touch. You look at Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania, Ohio and Kentucky, and you try to pick the freest, the most economically viable policies in order to grow economically. And you do that on a variety of issues. You do it on taxation. You do it on regulation. You do it on workforce rules, licensing rules, education. And when you do that, West Virginia will start to compete much better with all the states that we touch and grow as a regional powerhouse. And that's how you move from 48, 49, 50 in the national rankings and you start to rise up because if you can compete with the states that we have to face day to day, you're going to do very well. And I'm certainly uh, planning on that. And that's the beginning of the process. Thereafter, we're going to create a structure to make sure that we're going to be taking on federal overreach and the woke left from every state agency and every entity in our state. We're going to build upon the work we've done out of the uh, fighting the drug epidemic by actually building relations with the West Virginia First Foundation of the counties because we actually have a drug plan right now in place. For the first time ever, we actually have resources and a plan to attack the drug epidemic. That's needed with the fentanyl epidemic. And we're going to build a national coalition to list fentanyl as a weapon of mass destruction. We're going to work with the legislature on a common agenda to make sure on day one that we can act. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about the governor. It's about the governor working together with the executive branch and the legislature so you can have one agenda to go through with the House and the Senate. And that's what we'll be able to do. The other guys don't have that experience. It's going to take them a few years to learn their way around. We've worked on these issues, and I feel very good that we're going to be able to hit the ground a lot faster than all my opponents. <clears throat> See, this is why you never elect a writer as governor, because day one is all about this massive hangover. So after after the inaugural party, so we'd be talking about day two, really, as the first functional day. Anyone is a big headache. <laughs> Dry mouth. That's, that's good, guys. I like that. So listen, Patrick, the, um, the uh, this is absolutely not trying to go negative on this. I want you to clear up something. There's you know, there's been some negative advertising that's been going on about there. there. A big quote that's been getting a lot of airplay here. I'd like to give you a chance to clear it up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Patrick Morrissey got rich off lobbying for companies that produce puberty blockers for children. Can you clarify that with what the yeah, reality of that is? So this is really disturbing, right? You have multiple candidates who are running who just flat out lie, right? I think you should evaluate that and how you vote uh, coming up today because they literally made the stuff up from whole cloth. I'm, I'm going to explain so people know. When, when you hear that, know what happened. So imagine 20 years ago, right? I think that the evidence that people said – 20 years ago, I'm working and I'm doing legal work for a company, and we're helping to get a drug covered in Medicare for multiple myeloma. That's a particularly deadly form of cancer, and we wanted to be able to extend people's lives. I was very proud 
to work on that drug and to help out. Then imagine four years later when you're not working for the company and they're doing research, that same company's doing research on puberty blockers or other things, to be able to dare, to have the audacity to try to link those two and to somehow claim that one person worked on those issues, that's the kind of thing that should disqualify someone from running for office because it's deceitful. It's not treating the voters the right way. Obviously, I've been a national leader against the radical trans unit, uh, the agenda, and people know that because they know the work I've done to protect the integrity of women's sports. They know the work I've done to fight off the radical changes that are being proposed to Title IX, which gave so many opportunities to women. So shame on the swamp, shame on Chris Miller, shame on Moore Capito and Mac Warner for repeating all that. They know better. And in fact, if you asked and you walked through the example, they wouldn't be able to answer the question. That's what's amazing about it. So I've tried to run a different campaign. If you look at all the ads that we've done, we have to counter up what some of these people were saying. But every ad, I think other than one, was a pure positive ad about my record, what I want to do as your next governor. And I think West Virginians deserve that. And I'm glad you asked me because, you know, no one's perfect in life. I'm certainly not. But, uh, no, we never worked on any of that nonsense. And, you know, shame on these guys for lying like that. I think it should disqualify them from serving. And, and I will tell you, I think most people know that they've been deceitful. That's why, while you saw a little bit of a bump from some of the people after they started lying, I think people have seen it return back to normal uh, because they know that they were only able to clip a few points off of me because they were lying. And now people know the truth. And I think that that's why we're so well positioned on Election Day. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, our guest here on the program, uh, Election Day. But I, a, a note, I, I just received uh, this, and I want to pass it along before it gets worse here. Residents of the gallery, a 400-home subdivision in Martinsburg, are showing up to vote at their 2022 polling place in Arden, finding out they need to be at Orchard View Intermediate their old polling place. None ever got written notice, and Arden is listed on their registration cards. Oh so, folks, make sure you're going to the appropriate polling place if you're in the gallery uh, because of that mistake that was uh, made. Or You know, we should probably out. get someone to put a big sign up to out there when they're going to the polls to tell them to get to the right place. So yes. hopefully someone listens will do that. And you don't want to have this, this kind of stupidity that blocks people from voting. So. I hope that gets fixed. Patrick, you mentioned puberty blockers, and John brought it up with that question there, and there's a uh, pack ad with Riley Gaines speaking on your behalf. Can you talk about, obviously you don't have anything to do with the pack, but can you talk about your association with Riley Gaines and what it meant to you when she spoke on your behalf as she did? Yeah, it was really nice. So I think for those listening, I'm not sure, uh, Rob, how often he's talked about Riley Gaines or the work that she's done, but she was an NCAA women's swimmer and she's excellent she i think uh medaled in the big 12 12 times she uh placed very high in the ncaa's and uh, back a couple years ago there was a lot of focus on her and this uh, biological male swimmer who flipped to run in the ncaa women's swimming championships and riley and this biological male tied and so she got a lot of uh, fanfare for that And after she graduated, she really started to take up the cause to protect women's sports, women's safe places. So a few years ago, I had the good fortune to start to get to know her because, once again, I've been working to fight these issues for years. And this, my work goes back to 2015 when the Obama administration had their bathroom directive. So I got to know Riley, and she knew the leadership we had uh, to stand up for of the young girls in our state, in our country. And so when she heard that we were being attacked and lied about, I think she expressed an interest in coming in. And she also had heard about the case that's going up to the U.S. Supreme Court. That's the case to defend our women's integrity and women's sports law. So she came in. She did a press conference, and she talked about the importance of the work that we're doing and she talked about the importance of protecting women's sports and security. And she has a heck of a great story. She's a courageous young woman. And she was able to actually attract uh, a number of the young 
girls from uh, in Harrison County who also came to our press conference. These are the girls that protested uh, participating with the biological male. And I thought these were courageous young girls, and they've done the right thing. And so I, I think Riley, in some of the comments that she's made, she wanted to help clear the record because – she found, just like a lot of people, you know, the comments from Miller and Capito and Warner to be so outrageous. You know, you shouldn't be rewarded for lying. And I think I think Riley thought that. And that's why she had so many kind comments about me. And she's about the ultimate uh, third party validator because she's been working with me on these issues for many years. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, you mentioned uh, your three opponents with negative ads. Uh some of the ads against your opponents have been the most negative of all of them. The difference being they're under a pack and not you directly. Uh, but And you can say legally there's some separation, but in most of our minds there's not a lot of separation. Will you speak to that, please? Yeah, let me talk about that. I, I don't think that's right. It's not just a legal separation. I want the voters to know you can't coordinate messages you can't coordinate expenditures. You can't do that. So that's part of the reason. Look, I've run a very positive race. I've talked about the issues, and I know people will want to conflate this. I know there have been a lot of packs out by Capito and Miller attacking me as well. I think uh, Bill and Rob, we've had more attack ads against me than any other candidate. I don't think that's arguable uh, with the amount of money that Miller and his father have put in over $10 million and the money that – uh, Shelly Moore Capito is transferred to her young son, Moore Capito. Um, so it, it, there's a lot that's out there, but I think you have to judge people based upon the words they use, the actions they take. And so uh, I can tell you that we've tried to run on my record. We've tried to be very positive, and that's how we're going to run through the tape today. Mr. Gilstrap, last question for Mr. Morrissey. Since the – this is essentially the general election here in West Virginia, right? Whoever wins this primary is likely to be the, the next governor of West Virginia. So do you start right away, assuming that you do win, do you start right away working on your agenda with the House and Senate, the winners of the House and Senate of, uh, primaries to – so that literally on day one, absent your hangover – you can really get out of the gate quickly, or do you have to wait until after the general to get that going? Look, I think you always are working forward toward uh, your advancing your agenda, and we'll certainly keep doing that. Uh, but I, I'm not going to take anything for granted. I know there were some people that wanted to start talking to me about the general election or transaction a couple weeks ago after they saw some of the polls. And I said, I will absolutely not talk about any issues for the general or for day one in terms of, uh, I'm not going to assume anything. The voters deserve the respect of being able to go to the polls and vote today in the primary. I would humbly ask for people's vote. Uh, the voters deserve the respect to know that a candidate is going to get ready and be able to hit the ground running on day one. That's what I'm going to do. I won't take it for granted. I will end on this note. I think it's been over 100 years since the Eastern Panhandle has had a governor over a hundred years. There's an opportunity for the Eastern Panhandle and for everyone who cares about having a conservative, having um, integrity in government. And I'd humbly ask for your vote. It matters who you elect. And I want to say thank you to everyone on this call for giving me the opportunity over the 12 years to talk about the various issues and challenges of the day. And that's what we've done. And I think we've been able to get a lot done. Even more importantly, there's a lot more that we can get done to help our state be that shining state in the mountains, to help defend our country from the craziness that you're seeing out there. And, you know, we'll do you proud. And people know that. If you know the work I've done and you know that I come back home to the Eastern Panhandle, it used to be on average about every other week or so. Not easy to do, but I do it because it's home and I love it. And I want to make sure that I'm serving the people of the state, and the Eastern Panhandle and all counties of the state deserve good representation. Patrick, thank you so much for your time this morning and for all of the visits over the last uh, 12 years in this monthly appointment that we've kept pretty consistently. Hey, thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Best of luck to you today. Thank you, Patrick. Yep.